Okay, welcome to this workshop on sponsorship fundraising for the farmers for farmers markets hosted by Oregon Farmers Markets Association. AFMA supports farmers markets across the state with training, ad advocacy, and promotion. And we do, along with workshops, we have monthly peer sessions um, with open agendas for market operators to talk about what they do and share knowledge. And we also have workshops on a monthly basis like this. Um, the next one is coming up in November and it is called, Can This Market Be Saved? And then in January, we've got, let's talk about equitable wages and HR practices for farmers markets. Um, I'll put a link right now into the chat where you can get some more information about those and sign up for those. Um, really hope you can be there. And we hope that you'll be comfortable here too in our online world today. Um, feel free to be off camera if that helps you attend. Um, and, but we do love your participation. Um, please ask questions and share what you know and, and how things are done at your market. You can put comments and questions and give affirmations and talk to each other in the chat as well. And also in all you do here, please lead with kindness to this community of yours. Please share, but also listen to what people are saying and please leave time for others to share as well. Um, okay, so today we're gonna hear from Kirsten Salado, who is the Director of Membership Communications and Advancement for the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. And she's also been a board member twice over for two markets in the Portland area, the Portland Farmers Markets and Montevilla Farmers Market. And she's here today to share her experience on building partnerships with businesses in your community and securing sponsorships with them. Uh, so thanks, Kirsten. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, as um, Amanda mentioned, just go ahead and um, ask questions, chime in. Um, we will, I like to I like try to keep this pretty conversational um, if I can. Um, but um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I um, have been board members of Farmers Markets. Um, Farmers Markets are very near and dear to my heart. I saw that somebody was here from St. John's. I live um, right in St. John's, so I'm at that Farmers Market pretty regularly. So I'm glad to see you here. Um, just really quickly, I wanted to just talk about um, where I work. Um, I work for the Nonprofit Association of Oregon, um, and our mission is to strengthen the collective voice, leadership, and capacity of nonprofits um, to enrich the lives of all Oregonians. Oregonian. So we do work across the state, um, and we work with nonprofits of all kinds. Um, our um, our main audience is the 501c3s, but we also work with um, C6s and C4s and all sorts of nonprofits. So um, I'm glad to be here. And so a little bit about me, um, as Amanda mentioned, I am the Director of Membership Communications and Advancement at the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. Um, I have over 20 years of uh, experience in communications and marketing. Um, I have over 10 years of experience in development, including sponsorships and partnerships, what we're going to talk about today. Um, I've, raised, I've raised over $50 million in fundraising for nonprofits, and I've secured over $50 million in trade partnerships, which is something we'll talk about um, today as well. And I've served on nonprofit boards, including the Montevilla Farmers Market and um, the Portland Farmers Market. So what we're going to do today is really just an overview of sponsorships and partnerships and how to help you um, get them and um, give a little bit more background on, on why. Um, so I like to start with just some definitions, um, what sponsors can give, um, why approach businesses, how to find businesses to approach, what you need in place before making your ask, and how you can be a good partner to business sponsors. Um, if you can in the chat really quick or out loud, if you're comfortable, um, how many of you are comfortable, <laughs> like approaching sponsors and how many have sponsors, business sponsors? If you want to share, that would be great. If not, I can keep going. I'll give you a second. Anybody? I see a chat. Two business sponsors. Okay. All right. Okay. So about what I thought. So I want to start with saying I'm not a salesperson. I am a terrible 
terrible salesperson. Um, I used to work retail and I was always that uh, retail employee that nobody wanted because I um, was terrible. Like if you had to, if I had to upsell anybody, I just wouldn't do it. Um, it makes me very uncomfortable. So the good news for anyone that feels like I do is spon getting sponsors and getting business partnerships. It's not really sales. It is a little bit, um, but it is supposed to be, you know, mutually beneficial. So, and you don't have to uh, just start cold calling and being really obnoxious. Um, that's how I feel about sales people typically. You don't have to do that. I mean, if that's your style, then like go for it. And if you're good at it, then there's nothing better than like a really good salesperson. Um, but if it's not, there's definitely ways that you can really work through um, building these relationships for um, partnerships and sponsorships that it doesn't feel really hard. Um, but where I want to start before I even get into any of that is the difference between a partner and a sponsor. Are they the same thing? The answer is really complicated in the sense that it, the answer is maybe. Um, and I want to start there because it just depends on your organization and semantics. Um, partner and sponsor can either be used interchangeably or they could have really distinct differences. So your organization could call one type of support a partner support and one type of support a sponsorship support. Or it could just be used interchangeably. It's really a language issue. I use them interchangeably. I use my part, my sponsors and partnerships are interchangeable. If I call you a partner, you are probably a sponsor. If I call you a sponsor, you are a partner. Um, it is just a real semantics issue for everyone. Um, so I just wanted to start there so it doesn't get confusing for people. Um, and no matter what you're calling them, the core of everything is a relationship. So you're building relationships with businesses and businesses are made up of people. So you're building relationships with people. So your sponsors and partners can do different things and it can all count towards sponsorship. So when people think about sponsorships or partnerships, they think money, they think a, a check in the mail, that is awesome. And I love that for everybody, but that's not the only thing that partners and sponsors can do. And if you broaden what the way you think about it, um, it can help um, when you're thinking about your ask and, and who you approach. Um, sponsors and partners can be everything from money to marketing and social media support, um, to equipment and space donations, to entertainment, talent and time, and discounts and rate reductions. So for example, if you are um, looking for a bunch of booths and tables, you can approach a company that has those things and talk to them about it. And if they donate those to you, you can count them as a sponsor. You can figure out what the monetary value of that would be, and you can create a sponsorship or a partnership agreement with them so you can have their tables for the length or booths for the length of the, length of the season. They don't have to ever write you a check, um, but you are also saving money by not having to go out and purchase or rent those things yourself. So let's talk about why we should approach businesses. So um, corporate or business giving against philanthropic go goals. So um, you will have goals for yourself. You will have goals for your organization, goals for your market. And um, this can include exposure and new audiences. So that also counts for if you have a agreement with a media company or even an influencer or a chef that is you're seeing showing up all the time and um, posting about your market or being really enthusiastic and you notice like, hey, like every time this person posts about our market, we're seeing like an uptick in our social media engagement. We're seeing an uptick in um, in, you know, visitors where, you know, our vendors are really excited. I would encourage you to go chat with them and see how you can work something out where even if it's simple, like keep doing what we're doing, we love it, like here's a gift card. Um, that is enough to kind of continue to kind of build upon a relationship or grow um, into some sort of sponsorship. And then sponsorship spending delivers against your against business goals. So sponsorships for businesses are transactional. Um, so they also get something in return. Um, sponsorships for them can be tax write-offs. And sponsorships do not need to be huge. I think people hear sponsor and they think like, well, that's 
$10,000 plus. Like I just said, it can be something as simple as a chef showing up to your market every week, posting about it on social media and you noticing that every week that after, right after that chef posts about it on their social media, that your engagement goes up. So then you go and talk to them and you're like, hey, we would love it if you posted a few more times or you were our chef in the market and here's, you know, here's a gift card or here's, and that is, that can be something that you can consider a sponsorship. You can formalize that, you can make it informal, um, but it helps your growth and it helps their growth too. And it does not need to be a big, a big expense on your time or on their time either. So before I wanted to really jump into this, I want to talk about giving and a little bit of the elephant in the room, which is right now, um, inflation is a real thing. The economy is really struggling. People are really struggling. Um, and that does include businesses. Um, and you will hear if you approach businesses that they can't give or they're going to reduce the amount that they're giving um, because of what's going on with inflation. Um, and that is just something that is reality. Um, the other reality is, is it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be reproaching businesses or asking, um, because there are still businesses that are still giving. Um, so this is the latest, um, information that I could find that's credible um, by giving you a say around um, what was going on last year where there was still inflation and all of those things going on. And so we are seeing that 6% of giving is by corporations, which seems really small. Um, and it is, but that's still $21 billion. So it's not so small. <laughs> um, you know, it's still a huge amount of money. I think that all of us, um, you know, could take some of that happily. Um, and people are still, and corporations are still, and, and businesses and individuals are still certainly giving. The amount is down. Um, it will probably go down again this year, I would guess, um, because the economy and inflation are real um, for everybody. Um, but I do recommend not making that be too scary when you go in and, and make an ask or um, go talk to people because you will be surprised um, that, you know, it, it hasn't impacted to the degree that you would think it would because people's business accounts are not their personal checking accounts. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So like I said at the very beginning, um, the most important thing to me is building relationships. Um, it is not about picking up the phone and cold calling or sending cold emails or walking up to going inside of a business and saying, would you please sponsor me without ever introducing myself or getting to know them. Um, you really, it, it takes a lot of time um, to do this really well. Um, so it's important to enhance your mission, show growth at your apartment, at your market and provide benefit to the business you're partnering, partnering with. So some of that is being creative, thinking about what would work best for you and what would work best for them and what you're really looking for from them. Um, that I'll just use that example that I just used, that chef that comes to your market at the small independent restaurant down the street, they're not going to be able to write you a check for even a thousand dollars. Like they're not. So that's not where you would start with asking. Um, what you could ask is, would you like to be, you know, a chef in our market? Would you like to do an Instagram takeover? Would you like to, um, donate, um, some package meals for our vendors, you know, as a thank you, like, you know, some of those types of asks, those are more in line with what will get a yes and what will start building a relationship. And when that chef that works at that tiny independent restaurant down the street, maybe starts a small chain of restaurants in your area, that may be when they can write you a check for a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars. And, you know, that, you know, and it, but it starts building that seed of a relationship pretty early on. Um, so when you think about things, think about social media, think about advertising, think about donations of time and space and materials, and always be able to work with someone to put a monetary value on those things. Um, those in-kind donations are something that you can put on your own taxes um, and that they can put on theirs. Um, and they can always have an acknowledgement uh, and just come to an agreement about what you think, you know, what that um, that donation is worth. And then consider how your market can benefit the benef 
can benefit the business you're trying to work with and think of all sorts of angles. So you have to also think about what is going to be helpful for them. So um, is it that, you know, that that new person that, you know, is is showing up at your market all the time, but they have a decent social media following and you've noticed some engagement is letting them partner with you, like by showcasing them, also giving them the type of exposure that they're looking for. Is that chef getting new uh, people coming to their their restaurant because you're also posting about them and getting to know them? Is that donation of $1,000 from um, a local clothing store that's down the street are you thinking about how you're also directing people to go visit them after they go to your market? Um, you know, and if they're a bigger company, is it really just that they want, you know, a logo on your website and they want to be able to show that they care about the the community in general? And that's also something that is that is worth exploring and and can be very helpful for some of these larger companies that maybe don't need the foot traffic or the social media traffic, but they do want to align themselves with something like a farmer's market. So thinking through who you should approach. So who makes sense? Um, so what I like to do is I create a list of businesses and individuals that may have a business um, who already support um, our organization. So I make this long list of like, well, who do I know that already supports us? They could already be sponsors. They cannot be sponsors, but I see them all the time. Who, um, you know, who we want to, you know, to, to target. And then I make a second list of businesses and individuals that align with our values that I'd like to approach. So maybe they don't have, I've never seen them at the market. I've never seen them at any of my events. Um, but it seems like they should, they align really well. It seems like this makes a whole lot of sense. So I make a, a second list. And then I also do research. So what businesses support other farmers markets or like-minded um, events or organizations in communities inside and outside of Oregon? So you might find that you can look in Washington and be like, well, this organization, this farmers market in Washington has a bunch of sponsors that also have locations or audiences in Oregon, like, and they're in my community. Has anybody approached them? So I make, you know, I add them to that list. And then I think about who I share an audience with. So, and this is where you guys can rely on each other too across the state, where if you know that there's an organization that like, I'll just use Pacific Gas and Electric, they sponsor um, they have a foundation that, that has sponsored farmers markets before, and they are in multiple markets, um, like, you know, say demographics. So if you see that Portland Farmers Market, for example, has gotten a sponsorship from them, and it seems to make sense, um, you can reach out and ask how you got, how you, you know, if there's anyone that you can introduce, be introduced to, or how those people, like, how you figured out how that makes sense, or like, why they want to sponsor the market if it's not really clear and hopefully it would be really clear but you can figure out like well why would you know this utility company be interested in sponsoring um the farmer's market and get some information and then from that list i think about the ask that i'm making so i take my list and figure out what i'd like to ask these individuals and businesses so i think about like does this make sense um does it make sense that you know like you know, Alaska Airlines, you know, they, they like local food. I see in their magazine when I fly that they talk about chefs and they seem to be in the area, but are they going to sponsor my tiny farmer's market or even my big farmer's market? Is that worth our time? And does this make sense to do the ask? Maybe, maybe not. So like really think about that. Um, is it aligned with their business? And I also think about like what I want to ask from them. So like that example about that chef, you know, I know I'm not going to go ask that guy for a thousand dollars, but I might ask him to be my chef in the market for like the next three and donate his time for that or don't in and put a monetary value on that or do an Instagram takeover and put a monetary value on that. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily make the ask on the first contact. Um, you want, like I said, this is a relationship building game you don't want to waste people's time but you also want 
to find out a little, you don't want to just walk. I, I don't want to, you might want to, I don't want to walk in and just say, Hey, can you do this for me? Um, I like to really have it feel a little bit more organic and a little bit more like you come up with ideas together. So this is still doing more research. So just really figuring out the alignment. I think the alignment's really important. So um, my example here is like, if you're planning a health conference, you don't really want a tobacco company as a sponsor. Um, that's, you know, I think that's pretty reasonable. I think it also can be a lot harder than you think. Um, I think that there's a lot of like minefields that you're not always going to be aware of, or if you are, you're not always going to be able to consider. So for example, um, one of the sponsors of an arts organization that I worked for gave us $10,000 for one performance. They gave us $10,000 a year for one performance that we did every year. It was a different performance every year, but they picked one out of our catalog. And um, it was Boeing. So Boeing sponsored us. And we got a lot of comments about um, you know, being sponsored by, you know, people that make, you know, weapons of war. Um, we got a lot of comments about Nike being a sponsor of ours as well about, you know, like unfair labor practices. Um, is that what you stand for? And the answer is really no across the board. That was not what we stood for. And we, we did consider those things when saying yes to sponsorships. We also had to consider if we did not get those sponsorships, we couldn't put on, we couldn't do the work that we were doing. Um, and they weren't huge. They weren't full funding. They weren't fully funding our organization. If we didn't take their money, it wasn't like we would fold, but we wouldn't be able to put on that performance or do that or do all the work that we were doing because we did need the $10,000 or we did need the money from Nike. Um, so sometimes, you know, corporations are made up of people, but corporations are not people um, all at the same time. So you are going to have some, ethical issues maybe with almost every larger business in particular, but maybe not all the smaller ones, but you do have to think through um, the values and if it makes sense for you. And if you're willing to kind of um, have some harder conversations with some of your, um, your audience and some of your vendors, um, if there's um, some differences of opinions. Um, but that being said, most companies will proudly display their values and mission statements on their website, even if they're not um, a nonprofit organization, they do typically say like what they believe in or um, we'll put that on their social media. So you can really do some research around, around those things. And then, yeah, sour relationships can stir controversy and da damage your organization's reputation, both from the standpoint of um, a, a sponsor that doesn't make sense um, for your organization. Um, and then also um, a relationship that goes sour with a sponsor um, they can cause some damage to by just, you know, talking about that they didn't, you know, they didn't get what they wanted out of their sponsorship or they don't, you know, if you didn't do what you, you said you were going to do, that can be challenging as well. So I also think you should grow organically. Um, like I said, like Alaska Airlines may talk about local food movements or farmers or um, chefs in your community but they may not be the right fit to go approach right away for a sponsorship. So I think local. So it's gonna be hard to convince bigger organ corporations that they'll benefit from sponsoring you. And smaller nonprofits might find more success by reaching out to local businesses that are proportional in their, to their size of their organization. And that can really have like a quid pro quo around, um, uh, around beneficial, like how beneficial this is. That being said, Larger businesses and larger corporations tend to, if you can get in with them, they tend to be a little easier sometimes with um, how they work with you. Um, smaller organizations have smaller pockets um, and smaller amounts of time, smaller resources, and they may struggle to it may be really that $500 they give you might be really well earned because it's taking a ton of your time because they're just way more 
concerned about where that $500 is going, then a bigger organization that might, that $5,000 to like a Nike might not feel like anything. And they'll just write you a check. Um, and then you, they will leave you alone forever. Um, it just, you know, so you have to also think about the time of your staff and the time of your, of your board when putting these things together. But typically starting that with organizations that are in proportional in size to yours, and growing with them and building and building and building is the way that has been the most successful for me. But I will say that sometimes some small organizations and some small businesses can really make you work hard for your money, which can be really hard when you are a small organization or a working board or, you know, someone, a, a staff member that does six jobs at one time. So I wanted to just talk about a couple things that I've done that has worked that have worked really well. Um, so when I was at the Portland Institute um, of, Contem of Contemporary Art, um, which is um, an organization here in Portland um, that goes by PICA, we um, received an in-kind sponsorship. Um, I worked one out with um, OPB. Um, and why it worked was I was able to get um, ad time um, for months and also um, a, a, a television spot on um, their TV channel um, for free. Um, so it would have cost our organization, it was, I think it was $125,000 of value of ad time. Um, and so for us, we didn't have to pay for it. And for them, they were able to write it off and it also worked um, with their audiences. So um, because their audiences were interested in what we were putting on. Um, and that was a really direct benefit for us because we wanted them to buy passes and tickets um, to what we were selling. Um, how I asked was um, I introduced myself to their organization um, by doing some media pitches and also just reaching out to their um, director of sponsorships and just saying, hey, I would love to set up a meeting with you. I'd love to take you to coffee. I'd love to hear what types of sponsorships you, like that work for you and like what you already offer. Um, and if we can work something out together. Um, I would say it took about three months of um, different meetings and different back and forths um, for us uh, figuring this out together. Um, but once we did, it um, continued on for, it's still continuing on for about 10, 10 plus years now. Um, and so both organizations were able to get what we were looking for. We were able to get some ad time and some um, ticket sales. They were able to get, um, to reach their audiences with an ad that made sense um, for them. Um, and it has been a, a big benefit for us both. And they didn't have to write a check. They just, you know, they just had to give us some, some space. And then currently um, at the Nonprofit Association of Oregon, um, I work with Umpqua Bank. Um, they are a financial sponsor of um, a bunch of our networks um, here in Portland and out in um, Lane County. Um, why it works is they get um, their, they get, to be the the part the title sponsor um, of these networks, they get to be in the room. They get to introduce the speaker. They get to um, get to know the nonprofits, um, and and they get to give us a check to do those things. Um, and how I asked was this was an existing relationship um, that has uh, kind of moved as banks have turned over, um, but. Um, what we do is I, I get on a call with them and I talk through each of um, our options. Like, this is what we're working on. Does this, how does this sound? And I find out what they are looking for. Like they, one year, like DEI um, work is really important for them in certain markets. Um, other years, um, fund, they're hearing from their nonprofit, you know, people that bank with them that, you know, fundraising is really important. So we put together a package for them. Um, that seems to make sense for like what they're hearing, what we're hearing, um, and what makes sense for them to fund. And the ROI is really, you know, Umpqua gets to show that they support nonprofits throughout Oregon um, in their markets, and they get to know nonprofit organizations that are in the room to become customers. And for us, it funds our programming. Um, so it really is like this is, you know, we want to also introduce nonprofits to banks that care about nonprofits that will, you know, that will help with their work, but it also like funds their, their programming. So when you get into making the ask, um, what I like to do is like put together a summary of your event um, and your purpose and theme. 
um, your attendee demographics, your logistics, and your agenda. Um, and then put also put together a short narrative of like your event's history, the goals and the outcomes, the business case for support, and the invitation to engage, and then also like what the sponsorship tiers and benefits are. So for a farmer's market, you can ask people to fund, you know, or to, to sponsor the entire season. You can ask people to sponsor your winter market. You can ask people to sponsor your chef in the market or any sort of music entertainment. You can really kind of divide it up based on who you're asking. It doesn't always have to be season long um, for everybody. So it can just really be it can really be what you want it to be. You can figure that out. Um, I always like to include a history of the event. Um, so that way people that don't know you very well can get to know you. Um, and within that history um, and the business case for support really talk about, you know, how many people show up, like what, what it looks like, um, really get into some data um, and some descriptors if you can, because that really helps. Um, and then really think about like, you know, the, the goals and outcomes that you're, that you're hoping for with, um, sponsorship and for, and for the season on, on both ends. Um, and then the sponsorship tiers and benefits, I think tiers are really helpful. Um, not everyone does them, but I would highly encourage tiers, not just for the business, but also for your staff or for your board. So that way they know, um, what, people are getting for their money or their time or their donation um, and like what types of support um, that you are able to give them um, that's proportional to what the what the financial commitment is. So and this goes into building a business case for the support. So you're going to pick a project or a program or an event and then you're going to help understand why you and your initiative matter and why they should care. So you want to make it clear that like you're a really smart investment for them and you do really good work in the community and they can help. And then including those really like hard data points about your audiences, like so your newsletter subscribers, your social media subscribe followers, your website hits. If you do, um, you know, market counts where people show up and people are counting the amount of people that come in, like how many people you usually get to a market, um, how many vendors you have, um, how, you know, what your repeat attendees are, how much you've grown year over year, all of those things are really important to businesses. Um, and it's really important to lay that out for them. And then also really highlight your mission and what you do for the community. Like showing that you do really good work is, something that is important also um, beyond just like what you can do for them. It's look at what we're doing for the community. Look at like what we're doing for like where you run your business or where you live and like, don't you want to be a part of it? Like, this is how you can help. And like, this is why we need you. Um, that, that also um, appeals to a lot of businesses all the time. And it's really important to really make that really clear. So for sponsorship tiers, um, so I always kind of look around and think about what the sponsorship level, level should be and look at the overall event goal and to de determine what percent of your revenue should be sponsorships. So if you want to raise $10,000 in sponsorships, you might want to look for one top sponsor of three to $5,000 and then the rest can be smaller. Um, you know, if you want to raise fifty thousand dollars, then that number goes up to like you know fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. If you want to raise a thousand dollars, then you might want one sponsor that's two hundred fifty dollars, and then you know, kind of getting a lot of different smaller sponsorships. Like I said, these are all relationships, and to do this well takes a lot of time. So if you do have a lot of really small sponsors, think about what type of time commitment that's going to be for you or your staff to really make that experience really good for them. Um, and for you, um, I would really advise being careful about, you know, not wanting to send someone away for wanting to give you a hundred dollars. But like, if you have 20 people that are giving you a hundred dollars and you're calling them all sponsors, that may work, but it's just going to be a lot of handholding. And if that's something that is realistic and a good use of your time. 
So when you're also thinking about sponsorship tiers, think about setting reasonable expectations. So don't overshoot your typical giving range. Like if you typically bring in $2,000 a year in sponsorships, that's great. And you might want to say like this year, we want to try for 2,500, like or 2,300. That seems fantastic. Don't go crazy. Like don't say, unless you're doing a big event or something that you really think you can pull people in and don't say all of a sudden you're going to go from one year from $2,000 to $20,000. It could happen. It's just a lot, you know, and then you have to figure out all of that. <laughs> um, so I like to set reasonable expectations and I like to set reasonable expectations for what you typically ask of your business partners um, as well. So if you typically, if they know you to typically ask for between a thousand and five thousand dollars, if you approach them the following year and you're asking for fifteen thousand dollars and they usually give you two, you better have a really good reason that you're that you're raising it that much. It doesn't mean that you can never raise your your rates. I do all the time um, because things get like I just talked about earlier, inflation and all of those things are very real for everybody. Things get much more expensive. So a $1,500 sponsorship may not be viable for you anymore, but you have to think about what that incremental growth is and what that inflation actually means. So if, you know, if, if, if they were giving $1,500 five years ago, maybe they're giving $2,000 now or $2,500 now at most. Like you have to be really careful about, um, what you're asking um, and having people feel like they're still getting the value. Um, that being said, if their business has grown considerably and they are in a position to give a lot more, then that's something that you can really um, talk through with them and, and come to an agreement together. And then also explore other options. So if you are talking to some really small businesses and you're really small yourself, or even if you're not really small, but you're talking to small businesses that you want to grow with you, explore non-monetary options. So in-kind support may start a relationship. So like I said, that chef that you might be asking to do chef in the market or to, to do a social media, Instagram takeover, um, and you might give them a, a gift card or a really nice, you know, thank you for your time email or, or, you know, a handwritten note. They may be going on to open up a chain of like restaurants that, that is going to be fantastic. And they can write you a check in the next five years. And it's, it's really starting that relationship from, from where meeting everyone where they're at. So name your sponsorship tiers. It makes it so much easier for you and for them. I promise it sounds so silly, but it gets really hard, particularly if you have a lot of sponsors to keep track of everybody, because even within those tiers, you might have some agreements that are just slightly different. Um, so I try to tailor each of my sponsorship asks to the business. So I come up with it together, um, but I try to keep the monetary values of the tiers intact. So if somebody is giving me $20,000, they might, they're going to be a friend sponsor. And if somebody's giving me 10, a $10,000 check, but also $10,000 in in-kind donations of some kind, they're also going to be a friend sponsor. Um, if I don't name that, and uh, it's really easy to forget. Um, it doesn't mean that you forget what you are getting from them or asking of them, but it might mean that you forget what you have promised to give them back. Um, and it just keeps things pretty seamless on your end and on their ends. And it can also be really fun to come up with like little themed names, which I do also recommend because people think it's really cute and it helps also. Um, so a theme could be like a tilth or harvest sponsors or apple, flower or branch sponsors. I tried to think of different vegetables to do this, but then I was like, I don't want people thinking I'm ranking vegetables because they're all really good. <laughs> so, um, and then you can also just use like old standbys, like platinum, gold, silver, bronze, partner, friend, supporter. Those are all totally fine. It can just be really fun to think a little bit more creatively um, about the names um, and people do still get excited about that. So determining the benefits. So um, when you're thinking about what you can offer 
organizations or businesses that are sponsoring you, um, thinking about marketing opportunities. So inclusion in press relation, press releases and event programs, signage, um, recognition by event speakers from the podium, um, exhibitor booth at your event and recognition on your website and newsletter um, on social media. So something that's worked really well is like introducing speakers for us. So like larger sponsors get to introduce speakers so they can introduce like a chef in the market. They could introduce music. They could introduce, they could um, introduce the market at the first market of the season. Um, you know, we, people seem to really like to just get in front of people being in person with them um in out in the community has made a big difference and sponsors really really like that um but then always just making sure that their their logo and their name is um where you promise it's going to be and displayed correctly is also um always really important um, and then also benefits at events. So tickets to any event and to any VIP receptions reser or a reserved table um, or a sponsor representative on your planning committee or um, a sponsor representative on your, like when you are um, like letting new vendors uh, come into the market, um, whatever that process is, if it's appropriate to let a sponsor like a major sponsor be part of that process, you know, taste some, some new products and give, you know, give their opinions that can go a long way. Um, giving, you know, private, you know, market tours by the market um, managers can go a long way. People really like to feel special um, or like to, you know, and like to bring their, their people out to feel special and to show what they're doing. And um, if you can think of different ways to do that, that can also be something that people really enjoy. So um, this was a recent um, survey done also by Giving USA around um, the goals of uh, evaluating sponsorship opportunities. And as you can see, like awareness and visibility are like right up there. Um, and so is also like changing and reinforcing their image. So like, you know, really aligning with um, a mission or a values of an organization or a nonprofit um goes a long way and same with like just brand loyalty like if they've always sponsored that you know continuing that sponsorship and that relationship goes a long way um a little bit less is you know uh sales generating sales or usage of whatever their product is um which surprised me to be honest I thought it would be a lot higher um and then also um like I said, those, those opportunities to kind of entertain their clients or their prospects or their employees, um, that also, you know, people like that. Um, but really the, the big selling point is awareness and visibility. So it's just a reminder that those logos on your website or on your newsletter or, you know, letting them introduce a speaker um, or a chef in the market, it goes much longer. It's, it's a bigger deal than you might think it is. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind when you're when you're thinking about what your different um, benefits could be to your sponsors. So um, when, like I said, like when I meet with um, potential sponsors and current sponsors, I listen and I like to co-design um, sponsorships with them. So I like to make things custom. Um, I like to have lots of conversation and have some flexibility to make sponsors happy. Um, I ask what types of benefits they're interested in. Um, so like what success would look like for that sponsor and then, you know, build it to the tiers, um, but be fair. Like you don't want a sponsor to hear that like they're getting the same benefits as another sponsor and that sponsor it hasn't paid nearly, it hasn't given nearly as much. Like one sponsor is giving $10,000 and the other one is giving a thousand dollars, but they're, you know, getting the same deal. Um, you need to have a reason if they're getting the same deal. Um, so you can answer those questions. Um, but you, and because people do talk, particularly if they're at events, they will share some information and it's not confidential. Um, so I do like to, with the customization and the flexibility that can get complicated, but I do like to try to do what I can to make sponsors happy as long as it makes sense. So if a sponsor that's been a long time sponsor no longer wants to sponsor the same things, but they're still interested in sponsoring you. So say they've always sponsored 
your music program, for example, but they're like, well, we're more interested in sponsoring the entire market now, but we don't have any other, we don't, we can't give you more money for that. You can think about different ways that maybe you, you get them to sponsor parts of the market that they're not currently sponsoring or, you know, your winter market or, um, you know, your first six markets, you can really think about how to make it custom and flexible for them because you don't want to lose them as a sponsor and give them a different opportunity that they're looking for. So these are just some examples that I pulled um, that just kind of show like when I send over after those initial conversations, when I am finally ready to make that ask, what I like to give people as far as showing the tiers and showing the value. Um, and I've done all sorts of different things, um, but you know, just putting together a pretty simple design that you can actually make in Word, like you do not need a designer um, for most of these. Um, you can, um, for these two in particular, the, um, the charts, you can do this in, in Word or Excel and make it really easy for people to see and they can see the difference, the comparison between all of the all of the different tiers and then this um bottom one with the supporter this one that looks like a bar graph um that you can also do in something like canva um pretty easily <laughs> if you don't have a designer on staff um or someone that can do this um quickly and it also is a way to show um the different levels um i do think the comparison is really helpful because somebody that might think like oh wow like this, you know, silver $2,000 looks great. That's what I was planning on doing, but gold for $3,000, like that looks even better. And I can actually give that extra thousand dollars to get that. Um, you just never know what people are going to do. So I like to show the difference. <laughs> so with sponsorships, I think it's really important to be a really good partner and then you get a really good partner in return. Um, and this is where it does take a lot of time. So um, thinking people promptly and often and looking for ways to make it less transactional and more meaningful. Um, so it is that relationship building piece um, where it doesn't feel like a sales call. It feels like it's a really a meaningful engagement and they're really, they're part of something. They're part of your community. They're part of um, making, you know, helping you build your mission, helping you grow. And it doesn't just feel like you're just trying to, to get something from them. It's a really meaningful engagement. Um, I like to make engagement with them very easy, um, on their end where they don't have to do a lot. Um, they don't have to ask a lot of questions unless they, you know, you know, about how, how they can get you money or how they can donate or how they can be a sponsor. You just make it really easy. Um, deliver what you promise, and then get the little things right. So if you say that their logo is going to be visible, like make sure their logo is visible, like make sure you ask them for a logo file. Um, so that way you're not relying on something that you're just taking a screenshot from their website unless you have to, um, because they haven't gotten back to you. Um, you want it to look really good. You want to make them look really good. Um, and then my big thing is deliver what you promise. I really hate when people say that they, you know, under promise and over deliver. It is like a big pet peeve of mine because I don't want people to do that. I want people to tell me what they're going to do and then actually do that. I don't want someone to say that they're going to do something and then do way more than that um, because I think it's confusing. Um, and then it also gets really confusing if you're asking the following year for more sponsorship dollars then you have to like over deliver again. So if you over delivered on like the thousand dollar sponsorship that they gave you, but then the next year you want to ask them for two thousand dollars, but the two thousand dollar tier is exactly what they got for a thousand dollars. Like why would they do it? Like uh, unless they're just really nice businesses. Like it just doesn't make any sense. And it also is like I said, it's confusing. If you say you're going to do something, just do it. Um, you do not need to over deliver. Um, you can think promptly. Um, but you do not need to give more than you say you're going to um, in under normal circumstances. And then, um, you know, I like to have, you know, consistent and thoughtful communication. So follow up with your sponsors before, during, and after. Um, check in with them to make sure they're getting what they need. 
Um, phone calls, emails, face-to-face -face meetings, and newsletters are a great way to do that. Um, I try to do um, emails and also face-to-face -face meetings and sometimes phone calls. That seems to work the best for me. Um, no people are busy, so if they're not getting back to you, they're probably okay. Um, you typically will hear from people if they're unhappy um, or if they're really happy. You don't really hear from people if they just are feeling fine, um, particularly if they're super busy. Um, but definitely just check in and see how they're doing. Um, and then, you know, at the end of your engagement or even during, um, if you're getting some, you know, uh, if you're feeling like a little uneasy about it, um, definitely ask for feedback, ask what you can do differently, ask what was most valuable, um, just so you can one, like continue to build that relationship with them. But like finding out what was most valuable from, from them might be great because it might be something that you didn't realize. And that can be something that you can use in other asks as you go. And then lastly, you're going to follow up with a report. Um, so it's really important to show you the value um, and to make sure that you are um, making that really clear because hopefully you're going to ask them again and they're going to continue to sponsor year, year over year so that you're going to want to show that value. So um, I like to measure outputs. Um, the visibility of, of their logo, the traffic on your website, media coverage, you know, show pictures, um, show what what's really great about your organization, about your market, like let them see how much of a part of it they were. Um, and then like really amplify the impacts of um, their sponsorship um, and also the impacts on, you know, hopefully their business um, by sponsoring. Um, you know, I don't love, it kind of goes with that, you know, over promising uh, or under promising and over delivering. I don't love like the, metrics about, you know, if, if there was a media uh, article and the readership of like the Oregonian, for example, you give that circulation and you said that's how many people saw that it was a sponsor, that can be really hard and like a little misleading. You know, I think it's totally fair to show like your traffic on your website, show where all of their logos were, but you don't really know like how many people read that Oregonian article and saw that they were a sponsor. You can say the Oregonian has this circulation, you were mentioned, you know, it's fair to assume that, you know, this was well read by people in the community, but it's really hard to say that like, you know, 5 million people read this article and saw that you were like, it's really impossible to kind of quantify some of that stuff. And so I don't try um, because I just feel like it feels really kind of disingenuous. Um, but there are things that you can measure. You can say like our website, this page of our website got X amount of unique visitors every month that your logo was on. And that is something that you can fairly quantify. Um, other things are a little bit more challenging, but you can certainly highlight them as benefits without giving direct numbers. And then lastly, I would be remiss in saying that you have to stay in compliance. Um, so sponsorship should be transactional. Um, a sponsor pays a set amount of money in exchange for benefits. So in order for business sponsorship to be appropriate and legal, the benefit to the for-profit entity should not outweigh the benefit to the tax exempt nonprofit. So for example, a sponsorship of $500 should not include a market a table at the market if you typically charge $1,000 to vendors for that table. So they can't get, you can't call call them a sponsor and give them something more than you would um, a paying customer. You can, instead of, if someone says to you like, well, I wanna sponsor you, but I only have $500, but I want a table at the market, you have to give them the fair market price of that $1,000 that you're giving everybody else, unless there's something, there's an in-kind component to that that you can quantify. Um, if somebody wants to ask, uh, you know, quote unquote, sponsor you, but they aren't hitting that minimum tier that you're looking for, that's when I turn around and thank them for their donation. Like I offer them, like I say, like, you know, we can't, this isn't, these are our sponsorship tiers. We'd love to have you be a sponsor, but it looks like you're in more of an individual um, donor territory. And here's what we can do for you as an individual donor and like talk through those benefits, but they, they have to be two different things. And that's all I have for today. Um, I'm happy to open it up for any questions. Um, I know we kind of raced through that a little bit, but I wanted to really be respectful of your time. Any questions? 
All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, thank you, Kirsten. I, I mean, I'd love to have, if people want to talk to each other about sponsorships yeah. or what to do, I mean, the room is open until 1.30 if people want. Oh, Lisa has a question. Sure. Yeah, hi, thank you for that. Um, my question was around um, timing on when you would give that uh, like metric report back uh, between like when you're telling them like, these are the things you did and thank you so much. And then uh, like, hey, do you wanna sponsor again next year? Yeah, I think that there, those are two different things. So I think it really depends on your relationship with your, um, with your sponsor. So what I like to do for sponsors um, for the report, I like to do it within 60 days of whenever their sponsorship is ended. Um, I like to do that once they don't think I forgot. <laughs> um, and two, so I don't forget all of the metrics and things that I want to include. Um, and the longer it takes me to get to something like that, the more likely it is that I might forget to actually do it at all, um, just by the nature of everything that I have going on. Um, so in that, you can certainly ask for the next year, um, especially if you don't have that long in between the start of a new season. Um, if you have a while um, between the start of a new season, say you have like six months or say you want to reevaluate your tiers or something like that, um, I, you could wait, you know, a month or two and say like, Hey, like I'm reaching back out. Like, um, we reevaluate our tiers. Like, I'd love to talk to you about sponsorship again. I'd love to get that conversation back going. Um, you can really do it either way. Um, it also depends on an organization's, um, budget cycle. I always try to figure out if they close their year in June or if they close it in December. Um, and I try to hit them like, as they're making those budgetary decisions for the next year, because if you don't, it may mean that they want to sponsor you, but they can't do it until that following budget year because they just don't have it available. I hope that helps a little bit. Hi, Katie. I see your hand raised. Hi. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Hi everybody. So I'm curious uh, if you have any suggestions for places to look for finding comparables in terms of pricing. So um, we're considering sort of revamping our sponsorship pricing as well as our exhibitor pricing. Um, and we've struggled a little bit to find like actual kind of data to set it on. Uh, so we kind of have set it on what uh, pricing we've used in the past, but we're kind of wanting to um, reassess, like what is the market value of the different elements of our sponsorship packages to make sure that um, we're in alignment with, um, yeah, with kind of the market. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I think that that is also a challenge because it's hard to think about, um, you know, I know that you guys are on the bigger side um, for uh, Oregon farmers markets. So I think that um, it's hard to think about how that would be um, comparable with two, two other farmers markets in the state um, in general. I think what can be helpful is looking at um, other events that bring in the same amount of people week over week. Um, and that can be things like, um, like zoo lights, for example, like if people are sponsoring the zoo during that period, like and how many people are coming in, um, thinking, looking at Washington, um, looking at California, looking at some of the other markets that are around your size and seeing what they may not tell you how many people are coming in and out, but doing that estimation and then looking at their sponsorship packages, which they typically publish on their website. Um, and then also being really aware of if you're approaching the same sponsors, really being able to um, explain why some of your rates may be changing, especially if they're going up considerably. So if you're approaching those same sponsors that maybe gave you $10,000 last year, if you're asking them for $20,000, like what has, what has changed um, and if there's going to be any difference in benefits, or if you're just going to, uh, you know, tell sponsors, which I've had to do, like our tiers have changed your $10,000 is still super welcome. And we really, really want to, to take it. <laughs> We're not saying no to it, but you're no longer going to be at that top level anymore because now we have sponsors that we're bringing in at $25,000. So you're not going to be 
at the very top anymore and and really explaining why that is with inflation and and just the costs and and or not reevaluating your sponsorship tiers in a long time which happens also right. hi um this might be a little pedantic and I'm, I'm really not trying to be that way but um you made it really clear like don't make your ask in the first connection um and i feel like in my search for sponsors in the past, I've had a hard time walking the line between, hi, I want to initiate a conversation with you, however that happens on the phone via email, and having them essentially be like, please don't waste my time. I need to know what your tears are before I even respond to you, right? Because right. we're talking about these like $25,000 sponsorships. That's not the kind that we're looking for in our right. market. So, you know, if someone who's like, I can donate 20 bucks, I need to see that sponsorship tier that starts at 500 so I know how to respond to this email. So like, I don't want to start with, hi, give me money, but I also don't want to waste their time. Yeah, so I do two things. So a lot of times um, organizations that I've worked with, um, their sponsorship tiers are on their website. Um, so if I'm sending an email, for example, um, introducing myself saying like, Hey, I've seen you around the market a lot, or I, I noticed that you sponsor this other organization. I'd love to talk to you about, um, you know, opportunities. It doesn't mean you can't mention sponsorship in the first email. I just don't like to say like, Hey, like, I'd really like to ask you for $500 sponsorship in the first you know, conversation, unless the conversation goes that way. It's just, I don't like to do a cold ask like that. Um, but I am definitely saying, I will say to someone, I'd love to take you to a coffee. We're looking for sponsors. You seem like you'd be a great fit. I don't want to waste my time or their time either. If they're like, we would absolutely never sponsor you. Like that doesn't, you know, doesn't mean you can't build a relationship, but it has to be a different one. Um, so I usually link the sponsorship form at the bottom of my email, even if it's not a direct thing where I say like, hey, like, you know, like check out our, you know, interested in sponsoring, check out our tier, you know, sponsorship tiers. Um, I do that like below my signature. Um, if somebody is direct, like, oh, we're interested in sponsoring you, um, but we need to see those tiers. Yeah, because and, and then if they say like, we only have $50 and your sponsorship start at $500, like you don't want to lose them. So it's like, what can you do for $50? You know, like what can you, you know, and it's, and it is that relationship building piece. Cause hopefully maybe in three years they have that $500 or that thousand dollars. So, and also you want them to continue to engage with the market. Olivia, I was also going to say to that one, especially for smaller markets that are really neighborhood based or markets that are in small towns and your board wants to be involved in fundraising, but maybe is shy and afraid of doing the ask, reminding them that it makes your job easier to do the ask if when they are out shopping in your neighborhood at businesses that might possibly be sponsors, if they and, and they're regular they are a regular customer of those businesses. If they could just work into the conversation that they're on the board or something like that so that a person can have an association that the market is already like supporting them in ways. And like, they don't have to have a money conversation. They don't have to have anything. They just need to like tell people that the market is out there in the community in other ways than just having the market. Then it's, then you're not cold calling them so much too. And Lisa. Yes, hi again. Um, I was curious if you have any experience or advice I'm trying to do kind of, I guess, like equitable pricing based off of business size. Um, we tried to do something along those lines this year where it's like, oh, if your business is over 50 employees and you have to pay more than someone mm -hmm. smaller or someone in the neighborhood. Yes. Um, so yes, I do. Um, and a little bit different than sponsor. I, yeah, a little different than sponsorship. So um, at the Nonprofit Association of Oregon, we are a membership based organization. Um, we're not a C6. We are a C3. It's a little confusing, but we are a membership based organization. So our membership tiers um, are based on revenue size, um, which is really easy to do for nonprofits, a little less for for-profits because they may not be as eager to show what their revenue is, but nonprofits, you can look up their 990 and figure it out, um, but their revenue size. 
Um, so you can certainly do that. It does get a little more complicated on your end. I think it's a really admirable thing to try to do, um, but it does make the tiers and the benefits and things a little muddier depending on how you set it up. Um, but it's certainly possible if that's what you're asking. Um, it just gets a little, I don't know how you would ask people to kind of self-report how much money they're making or any of those things. Like it'll get a little, it'll get a little complicated, but I would love to hear about it if you figure it out. Yeah, we did um, by employee number. So if it was like okay. between one and 10 employees or 10 and 50 and then 50 plus. Um, I've just, I've talked to some like, big sponsors where it's like oh can you do this much money and they're like oh yeah whatever but then I've also talked to other people where it's like oh actually we can't do that and so I'm just like how do I get the people who like have to spend their marketing budget anyway how do I get as much as possible from them while like still you know yeah having other people want to do it yeah and it can get challenging I think where you're gonna you might run into I think it's really cool to think about it that way you can run into some challenges I would imagine by somebody that might have five employees, but they're just like making money hand over fist, you know, and somebody else that might have five employees that's like really just like making it each day, you know, Um, and it can just be really hard to know. And and people can get a little bit like, again, it kind of goes back to like making sure that the benefits feel equivalent to what you're asking. But I also think that um, if you can figure that out, I think that that, that feels really equitable. Um, and, you know, to, to think about smaller businesses that way and, and give them a lot of support and allow them to still sponsor in a way that feels really fair. Yeah, that might be tied a little bit to one of your last slides there, Kirsten. I really would have liked to have seen that while I was a market manager about how, like, the sponsor, the sponsorship amount needs to be more, give more benefit to the, um, to the non, to the, um, not the for, to the market rather than the, and like, and that language you use, because I did have a lot of people who couldn't afford very much, but wanted a table. And I wish I had been more like, well, that's like less than what our vendors are even, I wish I'd been thought to like frame it more in that way. And I, um, yeah, and it's certainly a compliance issue for C3s. I would have to look up the rules around C6s. I'm not as familiar. Um, I'm not unfamiliar, but it is a it is a ta- like it is a liability, like a tax. Like my um uh, our you know director of finance would be really mad at me if I started doing that. It just would make things really complicated. And it is like a it's a the way you have to frame it for taxes. Um they they can speak to it better than I can, but yeah, it is really important to make sure that the values align. Um, I'm going to jump on one of the questions that was in the chat and just kind of add to it. So Patty Case listed that um, they only have a part-time paid manager. And what do you suggest people do to find sponsorships when um, you don't have a lot of paid staff time? I feel like, at least to me, part of that answer is board support. Um you can answer Patty's question separately because I'm not the one teaching this webinar. Uh, but I would be curious just to add, how do you get, how do you help boards get engaged in this? Yeah, that's really challenging. I think that um, every board that I have um, worked with in any capacity, particularly NAO, like a big thing that we get from nonprofits is like, how do we get boards engaged in fundraising? Um, I will say that like, it is that kind of that mantra of like fundraising does have to be everybody's job. Um, It really does, um, even at larger organizations, but certainly at smaller ones. Um, And making that really clear from the beginning. So like when you're bringing on board members, like being really clear about what you think their role is going to be, um, what that time commitment looks like, um, what the expectation is. Um, Again, like you don't necessarily need to uh, turn your board into like sales people, but you need to say like, we do expect like you to reach out to X amount of businesses you know, per, per week or per month or per year, however you want to divide it up and um, just being very clear about that. Um, And then I do really empathize with those really small organizations with like one part-time staff member or no staff members in general, and they're just all volunteer run. 
that is hard, you know, I mean, and that's where I was trying to be really clear about these are relationships that take time. And so you really do have to think about how realistic and proportional you can be. If you have one part-time staff member and you're not getting the support from the board that you really need to be getting, does it make sense to make them chase down 40 different people to try to get $600? $600? Probably not, you know? Um, so like really thinking about how to maximize their time um, and, you know, really focus on like what the a realistic sponsorship goal is for your organization. If that's a thousand dollars, then think about like, are there two businesses in the community that we think we can get $500 each from? And that's two relationships that a part-time person has to try to build versus trying to chase down um, a bunch of different, you know, hundred dollar donations. It's still not easy because especially that first relationship building piece is a time piece. So where you can use your board, um, where you can really kind of try to multitask where I think about when I was on the Montevillo farmers market board a million years ago, it was so long ago. I was just thinking about how long ago it was. We gave out like flyers and things in the neighborhood, like postcards and um, things that they could put in their windows, like posters about the market, about the dates. I still see them for other markets around. Go When you go in asking if a manager is there or if any like decision maker, you know, type person is there. And when you drop off the flyer, having the conversation while you're already out doing that thing um, is great. And you might meet someone that's like, I can't tell you if we can give you any money, but like, here's the contact information for the owner of the, of the store or the business that kind of, it helps cut down on some of the time and you're already out in the community doing that. And that's um, to Amanda's point, really talking to people when you're out in your neighborhood, when you're out in your community and when they're out at the market too, like you're already there, like start, you know, you don't have to have a separate coffee with them. If you have time, if they're standing and you're already chatting with them, if you have 15 minutes to talk about, you know, we would love to really work with you guys. Like you're right down the street. Like, how can we part, like, how can we bring more people to you from the market? How can you bring, you know, how can you help us? And really just kind of starting that dialogue. Um, but And really do you really push your boards as much as you can to just say like, hey, like we need your help and make that really clear from when you do board recruitment um, and make it really well known that that's something you're going to be asking for and expecting. I'm curious if any of the, if people here would share who their sponsors are. Several of you mentioned that you already had some, not so much, not so you guys can take each other's sponsors, but just maybe there's um, types of businesses or types of sponsors that maybe people haven't thought of approaching and seeing. I mean, like, hopefully this should all, who your sponsors are should be public information on your websites and you should be broadcasting and thinking who they are. So anyway, so would people be interested in sharing that? Um, In the regards to what Kirsten was just talking about with the like conversations you're already having in the community, a really natural sponsorship came for us from the place where we do our banking as a business. So we were already in that small branch all the time, making deposits, being in there, conducting our own business with them. So it just naturally kind of turned into a conversation about how could we have your presence at our business? Cause we're already in yours. Our biggest sponsor is uh, the business right across the street from our market um, and they they sponsor a lot of different community events um, which is really great but they they do really well and they benefit from uh, our market being open on Sundays. Uh, we have a couple of different one excuse my voice I I'm catching a cold I have two more markets left I gotta get through them but um, we do a trade with our local radio station we also um, do use them for our advertising dollars. We give them that, but we also do an in-trade as a sponsorship. So they do three live remotes with us. It's a really good relationship because they're in the same building as we are. Um, The other thing we looked at is Northwest natural. Um, We have them as a sponsorship mainly because uh, winter time, making sure everybody has their homes are warm, that kind of thing. Our big sponsor who does our snap is actually Ziply Fiber. And the reason why that one works well is if someone is on snap, they also get free internet. So that kind of was a 
a good matchup. So we try to look at what they're going to sponsor matches up, if that helps at all. Anyone else? I'm wondering if anybody talks to their like local chamber of commerce or their county to find out about the largest employers in their area. Ashley, have you done that at other organizations you've worked at? And yeah. How's yeah, that? it was um, at yeah. another statewide organization. That was a first step in sponsorship programs was to reach out and find out who are the biggest 15 employers in your community and then reaching out to them. Um, and it was often surprising. Yeah, you can also typically get that information sometimes just by reading like Oregon Business Journal or Portland Business Journal, they will publish that that data as well. Um, but yeah, uh, chambers will give that. Um, uh, like you said, like county governments should give that information as well. And same with like the Secretary of State. Sometimes you can pull some of that information um, because sometimes it is, like you said, surprising or not as obvious. And you can also see a lot of times like what they um sponsored by looking at like, like, you know, looking at other organizations in your area. Um, I do that a lot by looking at other nonprofits um, that are similar or even not similar and just seeing like who their list of sponsors are on their website and then seeing, okay, like they, these people sponsor and I, I've never even heard of them. So like, I'm going to learn more about who they are. Okay, anything else? Any other cross last questions? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Kirsten. Thanks so much. It was really great. Happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye.